Okay, hello. I'm coming to you from a completely different spot in the house. Welcome to Books at the Bottom of the Stairs. My name's Loreen, and I'm going to do the new, new tube, what is it called? The Booktube Newbie Tag. This is um, something I discovered just a little while ago and thought about and thought, well, I've been doing this for getting cl very close to two years. January, it will be two years. And I thought, well, I'm not a newbie. And then I thought, well, I haven't really cracked 25 followers, so I guess I am still kind of new. So my little hope for this adventure is that I can just, oh, I just want to get 26 or 27 followers. That would be so cool. Um, and, oh, you know what else would be super, super cool? If I got more than five views per week. I mean, that would really just rock my boat. So that's why I'm doing the new book, the newbie tag today. So I'm coming to you from Halifax and Nova Scotia, Canada. And the question is, for the first one is, why did you start a booktube channel? Well, I, for me, the biggest reason was, uh, and this is pre-pandemic, although just barely, um, I just want to talk about books. I love talking about books. And in the book clubs that I belong to, too, um, both of them sort of had their start as YA book clubs. And the one that's been running for the longest um, um, is losing some of its uh, excitement for YA and we're, we're shifting into nonfiction and adult. But you only get to talk about one book at a time or the book that you're most re uh, reading most recently because uh, people are looking for recommendations. So being able to talk about just whatever you're reading, whenever you're reading, is just something that I like to do. And um, I've been a mom at home all these years, and uh, I'm used to talking to myself and nobody listening, so <laughs> it seemed a perfect fit. Uh, the next question is, what is something fun and new that I, my channel would bring to you? And I think actually it's my age that would bring something fun. I have, you know, decades and decades of reading behind me and hopefully in front. So I'm a little familiar with backlists of authors and I'm familiar with trends. And um, my education does have some English literature in it. So, um, it, so that gives me an, uh, like a, a standing point to refer to the books that sort of holds true over a number of decades. So if you want to talk to me about the history of Canadian literature, for instance, um, I might be able to go there. Um, I think the other thing that I bring to it is I'm just um, a no shit Shirley kind of a woman. And um, if I've got something on my mind, I tend to say it. Um, although in the interest of not saying anything harmful, if there's a book that I don't like, uh, I don't review it. But what's fun? Oh, okay. My bird clock is absolutely one of the funnest things in my videos. Does anyone else have a bird clock? I don't think so. And how many times have I done a video where the book, the bird clock goes umpteen? And you'd think that maybe after a while I'd figured it out, but. I'm just so used to listening to it uh, that I, do, I just don't really hear it as, as noise interference. So welcome to my bird clock. I also, uh, in the past, had little Cleo Bell join me from time to time, our little cat who's now gone. And I now have Taz, hopefully, joining me from time to time. Taz is a big um, partial Maine Coon who's as dumb as dirt and very, very gentle. And um, sometimes he really needs a bit of loving. <laughs> you never know when that's going to come. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's the answer for that. Uh, now, I'm gonna, the next part's gonna be a little bit long for me. The question is, what book or series brought you into reading? So, for me, my first language was Dutch. Uh, my parents emigrated here in 59, and a couple, you know, I was born when my parents were in their 20s, and Dutch was the first language. Well, in Dutch, you don't have the soft TH sound for things like think or thought. So when I finally got to kindergarten, which is what they call it in Ontario, kindergarten, um, I did not have that TH, so I would be saying tink or taught or sink or sought. 
So it was considered a lisp. Um, it, you know, I don't know how much of it was a lisp and just a, a lack of knowledge that that was the correct sound. So that's when um, my dad decided we were not here to be um, crummy immigrants. We were here to be part of a Canadian culture. And by gum by golly, that was the last I spoke Dutch. And that was like, a, like just cut off at the knees. So for me, reading was quite difficult because initially because not only was I instantly thrown into English as my primary language, um, I, it was very difficult for me to make the connection between the, the sounds and the letters and the words that had no meaning. I mean, k -at, cat, uh, probably I might have got that one quickly because we had a cat, but you know, that sort of logical thinking wasn't there for me. But I have a very, very like vivid memory of going to our little, little uh, library and um, looking at all these books. And I know for sure this was on the bottom shelf at the library. There was all of the, um, the Beatrix Potter series along the bottom in white. This isn't from then. Um, and I would pull them out because I was fascinated by these kinds of pictures. And these little animals were just so dear to me. Um, I just really enjoyed the anthropomorphism of them. It was magic. And I could understand what the story was about, you know, this, they're very, she, she's drawn very vivid action pictures for the most part. So with a child without um, really either language at that juncture, I couldn't read these books, but I could enjoy the pictures. And there's a picture almost every, um, almost every page. and. So I do remember this getting me into reading, having no idea. And my mom couldn't really read them to me either because her English was a lot better than mine, but just not really that strong. So another uh, next library in my life, I also vividly remember that they had these books, which I am sure are not on the shelves anymore. Um, and I think they might have actually been a bit of a different title, but basically the story was that there was a brother and a sister from each country. So Iceland, Germany, um, Canada with Eskimo, Eskimo children. Um, yeah, so there was, and so now I'm sure they were so stereotypical and they had such agendas that were being um, delivered to children, especially around being good and well-behaved, and oh my gosh, if you're Dutch, that is one thing you are, you are well-behaved. Well, good manners, good table manners, clean, and well-behaved. At the same time, the Dutch are famous for breaking rules if it suits their purpose, so. Anyways, these also had charming pictures, and um, my reading skills were not up to snuff for this book, but again, they were good entryway books uh, because I could understand the European children a little bit better than um, my Canadian counterparts because, you know, coming in as an immigrant, you don't know all the nuances and there were a lot of nuances. So the other book I really, really liked and could read much more easily was the Bobsy Twins. Now the Bobsy Twins, I am sure are off the shelves now, but this was a series um, probably about 20 books, the Bobsy Twins go to the beach, the Bobsy Twins have a picnic, uh, and they were, they were chapter books as well. The problem with them, they're, okay, so there was the two older siblings who were twins, and then there were the two younger siblings who were also twins, and mom and dad, and I'm sure there was a dog, but the problem with them from today's point of view is they had a stereotypical um, housekeeper who was a big, robust, jolly, black woman who did basically most of the parenting and all of the housekeeping and all of the cooking. And, um, you know, if you ever, was it the one movie called Maids or something? Anyways, I, you know, basically she's in a tough situation that we recognize today. But at that point in time, um, it was just, it was just the way things were done. If they weren't done in my household, they, I mean, they certainly weren't done like that in my household, but that you could um, see it on the news and so forth, on the medias, that that's what happened in other households in the States. And that was an American series. But the language and was easier. 
and because the younger twins were part of the story, so the language was just a little bit easier to get. And the other part was it made it very clear for me what it was like to be a white family in North America. And, you know, Dutch, I was a lot blonder as a, as a young child. I, I blended in quite easily. That was not my trauma. My trauma was just losing my language and, and having no foothold in English to speak of. That was my trauma. And the other part that was traumatic for us, as my brother and sister and I, was um, we didn't know about things like birthday parties or hot dogs or pin the tail on the donkey or tobogganing. These sort of things that kids did were not... Um, okay, I'm just time out here. I could stop this video and I could go and correct the cat who has climbed up on the kitchen table to eat the kibbles of the other cat. But I think I'm going to let him be bad today. Yeah. So, because that sort of feeds into what another future question is. So anyways, back to the story. Um, we just didn't really know these things. The whole Christmas village I remember going to as a young kid. Like, Oh, no idea no idea so the Bobsy twins for me were a, a gateway book and I'm glad they're off the shelves but they really made a big impact and then I discovered Half Magic and Half Magic is a wonderful book I, when was it written um a long ago uh 1954 and this it's a family story and there's I can't even remember the whole Point of it but there was something that granted wishes and the wishes didn't come completely true you ended up getting half of what you wanted and um, I loved magic there was no magic in my life it was just a very you know plain old normal nothing much kind of a family going on Catholic which is you know not magic but bizarre um, says she who hopes she doesn't offend any Catholic viewers, but really, is there any difference between that baby and um, Mother Mary levitating? I don't think so. Um, okay, anyways, <laughs> half magic was my discovery point into magic, and I loved it, and that was a page, like, that was a real change for me, and the other book that I came across was, and I don't even dare open this, is my version of Anne of Green Gables. Basically, I am Anne of Green Gables. My entire generation of females is Anne of Green Gables. I know that there have been movies and, and series and so on since then, but you have to understand, when I was reading this book, there were, any, there were no other alternatives out there. There were maybe, on any given year, there were maybe three books that we could get from the Scholastic catalogs. Um, that's something I don't know if you had where the Scholastic uh, publisher would send book a catalog to the classroom and you could take it home and ask your parents if you could buy a book or something. But that happened once a month and the books repeated from month to month. So there really just wasn't anything to be, to be out there. And Lucy Maud Montgomery wrote a gazillion books but I read these over and over and over. And it's the I think they're the only books I ever seriously reread. And in fact, my husband and I reread this as the first one as a read aloud about a decade ago now. And I didn't realize this how incredibly poetic it is. I was reading it entirely for plot and character, and when we reread it, we realized just the setting and the descriptions, oh my gosh. And I know I know it's sentimental and you know, well, so what, I was a kid, so what? And then there was Nancy Drew and she has, I don't know how many books. We tried to do this one again uh, as a read aloud. Um, my, my dream in those days was to own every single Nancy Drew book there was. And I saw uh, something go past the other day where there's a booktuber who does have a collection of all the Nancy Drew stuff out there. <laughs> Good for her. But um, I, I'm, I have about 13. Same kind of deal, you know. It's just a, it's an idea of or an inkling as to what it's going to be like to be a teenager with a car 
in America, um, there were no cousins or anybody, um, older brothers or sisters of my friends who were teenagers. So it was just quite an eye opener. Uh, like I fully expected a car to show up when I was about 15. Like who wouldn't? <laughs> I don't think my sister read these books. I don't remember her seeing them. I must ask her if she thought she was going to get a red convertible for her 16th birthday. <laughs> well, by the time I said, no, let's not go down that. So I started reading when I was really young. I mean, I'm going to say that my devotion to the library was pretty intense at a very young age. And I'm, so I'm going to say five. And um, I hounded my mom to take us to the library and she would get some picture books and, and that's kind of how we would work our way through um, the reading crisis that I faced. And my brother and sister didn't because they were just that much younger that English was a first language for them right from the get-go. So um, I did start reading quite a bit. Now I had an interesting moment in my life when um, I had a concussion and I couldn't read for about six months because the page just kept wobbling. And then in this winter past, when I had my big um, lung problems, again, I couldn't read because it was too heavy to hold up books. So um, those are, were moments when I really reflected on just how important reading was to me. And it's been with me, um, I would say, I would say there is never a time when I don't have multiple books on the go. Um, so. All right, what's another thing that they asked us? What is a question to ask favorite booktubers? All right, this might be a little bit contentious. Why are we wearing makeup and the men aren't? That's my question. Why do we go to all this trouble to look absolutely gorgeous and the men just, you know, come on with their, you know, their hair and their t-shirts and their whatnots? I mean, most of them probably, they look like they have at least showered, but I just think, Huh, I would rather do this without lipstick on. So please admire the lipstick. Please admire, oh yes, I put my eyebrows on so they're just, you know, a little bit darker so that you can see them so I have some facial definition. But yeah, I don't want to wear makeup. All right, um, where do I read? I am doing this video where I love to read. This is the, I'm in my kitchen seat. This is where I have breakfast and lunch and sometimes dinner. And I love to put my feet up. There you go, that's my foot on the kitchen table and read like this with a cup of tea. I am demonstrating in case you don't understand. I love it here. There's beautiful light. I can see out into the backyard. Cats wander around. Quite often my husband is busy puttering, doing whatever he does. This is my son's master's thesis summarized on my fridge and my daughter over there. She's doing weightlifting with her uh, boyfriend. And those are quotes that we decided, we started that about in 2011 and we've never wiped it off. <laughs> we ran out of significant things to say to ourselves. So I really enjoy this room. It's a bit cold in the winter. Um, in that case, I tend to shift to the living room with a blanket, but even then I still like to come down here with a, a warm sweater on and big socks and have my cup of tea and just Oh, there's great light coming out of the window that you can't see because it's too glary. And yeah, I just, I eat, I read here with breakfast. I know you're not supposed to read and eat at the same time, but I love reading while I'm eating breakfast. And quite often I have lunch by myself. Um, and sometimes Steve comes home for work. He lives quite, we, he works quite nearby. And um, yeah, I just, I'll eat while I'm, I'll read while I'm eating. My two favorite things. <laughs> okay, um, what kind of books do I like to read? I would say fiction for the most part. Um, although I'm really getting lucky with nonfiction in the last little while. I've um, I do not like nonfiction that where the where the author's journey is part of the book. I'm I'm more interested in it from a um, arm's length kind of research kind of a way, but I still like it when it's um, entry level language so that you really get the picture of what. So I'll be talking to you a little bit that about that in um, Nonfiction November, which is coming up. Um, I love middle grade readers. And you know, I've been criticized on that in the past, but if you wanna be happy, if you wanna have a 
conclusion. If you want characters that aren't going to give you headaches, go for a middle reader. The plot is always solid. The characters are always perfect to the plot and vice versa. The setting quite often is very interesting, especially if there's magic and dragons. Um, I do like middle readers where there's some kind of a challenge afoot and um, I don't like middle readers that, you know, are trying to teach you a lesson about be good or something like that. I, I, like, a, I like a naughty character. Um, I do read YA, uh, not as much as I used to. Um, I've, there's a moment with the YA, here's where my age comes in, where we had all these problem books where the protagonist had to have bulimia or eczema or a broken leg or from skiing or, you know, anyways. And then in the meantime, but in the background, somebody's dead and the dog has run away. And, you know, so there's just all these kind of catastrophic, catastrophic problems that the teen need to be getting through. Um, and now we've moved on to a different kind of got it checked box where we've got um, characters of color or diversity. Fair enough. No problem with that. But when that is like a selling point of the book and you read the book and that person could equally have corn stalks growing out of their ears and it, because it doesn't add a damn thing to the story I get pissed off I like my characters to be integral and have integrity to uh, the dilemma and the plot lines and um, I don't like them to just be a check off and the couple of books that I've picked up recently not only has that been the case with the main characters but you know then we've got a friend who's um, got facial distortion and, and another friend whose mother ha it has died from cancer or like it's like everybody's got some kind of big honking problem and we don't really see into any of them with any kind of real um, depth or nuance or they're just very shallow and transitory books and that I don't like that in any genre so that's my rant <laughs> that's not answering what I like to read. That's what I don't like to read. Um, so I also like uh, Canadian fiction. I try to keep up with certain authors. I've got about 20 Canadian authors that I kind of like to, you know, keep checking out. And I am on a current project to be reading classical Canadian literature by women authors. Um, I've also read First Nation authors for as long as they've been available, so uh, that's not a new-to-me thing. Louise Erdick comes to mind right off the bat. Thomas King, which I spoke about in, in an earlier video. Um, Thomas King is sometimes Canadian and sometimes American. I think it just depends on what bookstore he's in. <laughs> but he he's a well-known Canadian broadcaster for the CBC, so we claim him as Canadian, because why not? He's not around to hear it. Um, yeah, so there's a couple of other Canadian authors that I really enjoy that are contemporary. Not so much Canadian authors who are in the past. Most of them came out, that I'm aware of come out of the sort of 50s and 60s, and some of their early works were interesting, but then after a while they got a bit tedious. Um, yeah, what else? I'm not usually on top of things like the Booker Prize or the National Booker Prize. Um, Occasionally, I'm, I'm, I tend to veer towards British books more than American books. I don't really, I, I guess I just get kind of tired of American things. Not that they aren't valid or anything, but I like a broader perspective. And um, I'm paying more attention to books in translation. A lot of those early books in translation were coming out of Iran, um, the Middle East in general, China. And now books and translation just seem to be a lot more um, available from different countries. So I'm trying to pay more attention to that. That's kind of my next year's pro not so much project as just awareness to be alert to. Um, so that's what I like to read. And um, I'm not a magazine reader for the most part. And I do not like to read things where children are victims in any kind of a way, which is why I struggle with memoir, because a lot of the memoir we're reading right now, or that's available right now, are people who have had pretty 
crap lives. And for that's a bit of a trigger for me, but also um, I, there's just so many times when children are victims that I, I struggle to read it again and again and again. It's, um, which is maybe why I read mill readers, because sometimes the kids there are, are struggling against the same sort of things that are in the memoirs, but generally they're rescued. And with memoir, most people aren't rescued. They're still struggling. So that's it for me. Um, I think I think that's it. I hope you enjoyed getting to know me. It's a bit of a long video. Um, but I think I'm worth it. I hope you enjoyed getting to know me. And I hope that all your reading dreams and adventures to Kim continue to come true. Bye-bye for now.